In this video, we'll cover the basics of cardiac auscultation and explore the key murmurs to listen for when examining patients. I've got some really cool custom animations that should help you understand how the heart sounds relate to the cardiac cycle. I've also got a challenge at the end of the video, so stay tuned to see if you can crack it. Cardiac auscultation refers to the process of listening to the heart through the chest wall with a stethoscope. It's formed the cornerstone of the cardiovascular examination since the stethoscope was invented by French physician René Linac in 1816. Stethoscopes amplify the sound coming from the heart and mean we don't have to directly touch our ears against a patient's chest. To understand the sounds the heart makes when it beats, let's first consider the normal cardiac cycle. When an electrical impulse originating in the sinoatrial node reaches the ventricles, they contract, which starts ventricular systole. This causes the atrioventricular valves, i.e. the mitral and tricuspid, to rapidly slam closed to prevent blood flowing back into the atria. Almost simultaneously, the aortic and pulmonary valves open and blood is ejected forcefully into the aorta and pulmonary trunk. Towards the end of systole, the pressure produced by the ventricles starts to decrease below that of the pressure in the arteries, which causes the aortic and pulmonary valves to slam shut to prevent the backflow of blood into the ventricles. This marks the start of ventricular diastole. Shortly afterwards, the atrioventricular valves open to allow blood to fill passively from the veins into the atria and ventricles. Towards the end of ventricular diastole, a new electrical impulse reaches the atria, which then contract to force blood into the ventricles through the open atrioventricular valves, and then the cycle restarts. A normal heart generally produces two sounds for each cardiac cycle, sound one and sound two, known as S1 and S2 respectively. These sounds are produced as valve leaflets slam shut against one another. S1 occurs due to the closure of the atrioventricular valves and therefore indicates the start of ventricular systole, and S2 occurs due to the closure of the aortic and pulmonary valves and therefore represents the end of ventricular systole. As such, ventricular systole occurs between S1 and S2, and diastole occurs after S2. You can palpate a central pulse at the time of auscultation, the sound occurring just before the pulse is S1, and the sound occurring just after the pulse is S2. Now let's look at how murmurs occur. Blood flow in the heart and vasculature usually exhibits laminar flow, which means it's smooth and moves in parallel layers, with the fastest flow in the centre of the cavity. It does not usually produce any sounds. In contrast, blood can instead exhibit turbulent flow, which is chaotic and irregular with blood swirling. There are generally two causes of turbulent flow. Firstly, where a normal amount of blood travels through a pathological or narrow orifice, for example in aortic stenosis, where blood is forced through a narrowed aortic valve orifice. Secondly, where a supranormal amount of blood travels through a normal or non-pathological route, for example a flow murmur in an anemic or pregnant patient. Turbulent blood flow can create an audible whooshing sound on auscultation. If this occurs due to blood flow in the heart, it's called a murmur. If it occurs from the vasculature, it's called a brewy. By the way, if you're finding this video useful, I'd really appreciate it if you give this video a like and consider subscribing to see more like this in the future. So how are murmurs classified? Murmurs can be classified in the following ways. Their timing relative to the cardiac cycle, where they are loudest on the chest, how loud they are, what makes them louder or quieter, and where they radiate to. Timing a murmur is the most important first step. Murmurs can occur in systole, between S1 and S2, diastole, between S2 and before the next S1, or can be continuous, occurring throughout the cardiac cycle. What about the location on the chest where the murmur is heard loudest? There are six main auscultation locations on the torso. The aortic area is located in the second intercostal space on the right-hand side of the sternum. The pulmonary area is in the second intercostal space but on the left-hand side of the sternum. The tricuspid area is in the fourth intercostal space on the left-hand side of the sternum. And the mitral area is in the fifth intercostal space on the left midclavicular line. Finally, murmurs can radiate to two additional areas, the axilla and the carotid arteries. There are other areas, but these are the main six you want to listen to when examining a heart. 
Murmurs can also be graded by their maximum intensity out of six, although beware that murmur loudness does not always correspond to valve lesion severity. There's also a degree of subjectivity here. A one out of six murmur is quiet and only audible after listening for a while. A two out of six murmur is quiet but audible immediately. Three out of six murmur is loud and audible immediately. A four out of six murmur is loud and associated with a palpable thrill. This is a vibration that is palpable with the hand on the chest wall due to turbulent blood flow. A five out of six murmur is very loud and audible with the stethoscope only partially touching the chest or placed elsewhere in the body. And finally, a six out of six murmur is audible without a stethoscope. Murmur intensity can be modified by various manoeuvres, of which inspiration and expiration and positioning are the most commonly performed. Inspiration with breath holding usually exacerbates murmurs created by the right side of the heart. Inspiration sucks more blood from the vena cava into the right atrium and ventricle, which increases flow rate and hence turbulence across the right-sided valves. It makes left-sided murmurs quieter as less blood returns to the left atrium and ventricle from the lungs. In contrast, expiration with breath holding does the reverse. It decreases the intensity of right-sided murmurs and increases the intensity of left-sided murmurs as more blood is pushed from the contracting lungs into the left atrium and ventricle. Left lateral positioning increases the loudness of mitral murmurs as a mitral valve is brought closer to the left lateral chest wall. In contrast, sitting forward increases the loudness of aortic murmurs as blood moving through the aortic valve is directed more towards the anterior chest wall. Now let's look at the different types of murmurs in more detail. Ejection systolic murmurs start in early systole and are initially relatively quiet, get louder until mid systole and then go quiet again in a crescendo decrescendo pattern. The main causes include aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, flow murmurs, atrial septal defects, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The aortic stenosis murmur is loudest in the aortic area and radiates to the carotid arteries. It's often loud, but the loudness of the murmur does not indicate its severity. It's made louder by sitting forward and held expiration. For a detailed summary, see my aortic stenosis video, link in the description. Pulmonary stenosis is loudest in the pulmonary area and does not significantly radiate. It's rare and usually quiet. It's made louder by held inspiration. Flow murmurs occur due to an increased blood flow through a structurally normal heart and can occur in childhood, also called an innocent murmur, or hypodynamic states such as pregnancy, anemia or sepsis. They are often quiet, loudest at the left sternal border as they are thought to primarily occur from increased pulmonary blood flow and do not radiate and get quieter on lying flat. Atrial septal defects often cause an ejection systolic murmur. This is because there is an increased flow of blood from the left atrium to right atrium and hence then across the pulmonary valve. It does not radiate and may be associated with a fixed split second heart sound, which we'll cover in a separate video. Finally, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can also cause an ejection systolic murmur across the precordium due to LV outflow tract obstruction, but it typically does not radiate but it is made worse by the Valsalva manoeuvre. Now let's look at pansystolic murmurs. Here, the murmur has an equal intensity throughout systole. Let's have a listen. The main causes include mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation and ventricular septal defects. Mitral regurgitation produces a blowing, often high-pitched pan-systolic murmur, which is loudest at the cardiac apex and classically radiates to the axilla. The murmur is often fairly loud and is exacerbated by left lateral tilt and expiration. Tricuspid regurgitation produces a quiet pan-systolic murmur, best heard at the left lower sternal edge. It does not radiate and is made worse by inspiration. Ventricular septal defects produce a harsh pansystolic murmur across the precordium. They classically do not radiate and are not exacerbated by respiration. 
A smaller VSD often produces a louder murmur due to more turbulence through the smaller defect. This paradoxically means that larger, more hemodynamically significant VSDs have a quieter murmur. Early diastolic murmurs occur just after S2 and decrease in intensity as diastole progresses. They are sometimes also associated with a systolic flow murmur due to the increased filling of the ventricles caused by the backflow and hence turbulence in systole. Let's have a listen. The main causes are aortic and pulmonary regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation causes an early to mid diastolic murmur, loudest at the left lower sternal border, which is the direction of blood flow back through the incompetent aortic valve. It is exacerbated by expiration and sitting forward. It is often associated with a widened pulse pressure, which is the difference between systolic and diastolic pressures. Pulmonary regurgitation is rarer but causes a quiet early diastolic murmur, loud on inspiration. Finally, mid to late diastolic murmurs are caused by mitral stenosis or more rarely tricuspid stenosis. Let's have a listen. In both, the murmur is often low pitched, rumbling in nature and very quiet. The murmur in mitral stenosis is often only audible on expiration, left lateral tilt, and with the bell of the stethoscope, which is best for low pitch sounds. If the patient is in sinus rhythm, there is often what is called pre-systolic accentuation, where the murmur gets louder just before S1 due to atrial systole forcing blood through the narrowed valve. Whereas if the patient's in AF, there is no pre-systolic accentuation, and AF is very common in those with mitral stenosis. Let's have a listen to a murmur with presystolic accentuation. Now for a quick challenge. A 62 year old man with advanced chronic airways disease presents with worsened breathlessness. You perform a cardiovascular examination and hear the following. Let me know in the comments what you think of the murmur and what you think the most likely diagnosis is. And that was the Murmur Master Summary on Cardiac Auscultation and Murmurs. If you found this video useful, it would really help the channel if you could consider giving this video a like and subscribing for more content like this in the near future. Also, if you'd like more practice at Cardiac Auscultation, the Murmur Master app has hundreds of heart sounds from real patients and has already helped thousands of students and medical professionals globally. You can find it on the App Store now. See you next time.